Hello, everyone. Good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are in the world. My name is Christian Hodges. I'll be hosting today's panel discussion for the Harvard Association for Law and Business. Um, we're so fortunate to have with us today several attorneys from Morgan Lewis. Um, so what we're going to do today is I'm going to introduce them, and then we're going to go through a presentation on introduction to capital markets and public companies. And so why don't we go around and int everyone introduce themselves to start. We have um, Raul Mendoza, who's an associate in Washington, D.C. office, and he works in structured transactions. Um, I'll just go through and, and kind of go through everyone speaking, and then we'll have them kind of uh, say hello and a little bit more about themselves. We also have Karen Abbasamas in Silicon Valley office, who works in, in the emerging business and technology and M&A practice areas. We also have Brian Kegery, who's in the Boston office, works in capital markets. And last but not least, we have Caitlin Kelly, who's an associate in the New York office, who works in structured transactions. So why don't we go around, Raul, to start, maybe say something else about yourself, something um, exciting you've picked up during this COVID time, and we'll kick it around, and then we'll kick it over to you to get us started on capital markets. Absolutely. Uh, so I am a six year at the Washington DC office of Morgan Lewis, uh, which is happens to be our largest office by headcount. Uh, fun thing for COVID is I, I realize I'm into cooking like massive sizes of meat in like this Dutch oven that my mom gave me. So I've been uh, really getting getting interesting stuff with my culinary skills. Um, and to, you know, we're supposed to bring a fun fact. My, my fun fact to play to the audience here was that I ran a race um, in the Harvard, Harvard indoor, indoor gym back in high school a long time ago. So uh, quite a fun time for me and a uh, nice facility. Well, I'm happy to go next. I'm uh, Karen Avasamas. I'm a partner, um, as Christian mentioned, in the Silicon Valley office. I started as a summer associate in 2007 uh, and became a partner in 2018. So total homegrown from the very beginning um, at Morgan Lewis. Um, fun fact about um, COVID, I guess, is that I realized that teachers should make a million dollars. I have two small children. Um, the spring was incredibly difficult, like way more difficult than handling a billion dollar M&A. Um, so uh, yeah, that's my fun fact. Thanks, Karen. Uh, my name is Brian Kegery. I'm a capital markets partner here in Boston. Uh, like Karen, I'm also a Morgan Lewis lifer. I summered in 2008. Um, been with the firm my entire career. I guess one funny thing, I, again, to, to, uh, to mirror Karen, I've got two small kids and uh, trying to continue working while also playing defense against a five and a two and a half year old is uh, been the biggest challenge of my career so far. I'm Caitlin Kelly. Um, I've been at Morgan Lewis since 2018. Um, I went to Fordham Law School and um, my fun fact about Harvard is that the tiny town I grew up in in Connecticut, our only claim to fame is that we host the Harvard Yale Regatta each year um, and truly nothing else happens in my town except for that each summer. So um, I, I don't know what happened this past summer with COVID, but uh, it's definitely the only exciting thing that happens in my town. <laughs> Great, thank you so much. And now let's kick it over to Raul to start us off with an introduction on capital markets. Absolutely, thank you, Christian. And thanks everyone for having us out uh, today uh, to, to hear about what we do and what capital markets uh, mean for you potentially. So uh, the term capital markets is a general term we use to describe a variety of transactions uh, that someone who needs money gets money from someone who has it and that's you know the most general way we can describe it and the people who typically have money are you know the banks investment funds investment funds um, um, managers investment managers of this world now there are two primary uh, ways to do this there's uh, what we call the equity raise and there's a debt issuance uh, there's also a third sort of hybrid uh, combination of the two things so everything we talk to you about today will just uh, be one form of that or another. 
And one thing that we were thinking about in making this presentation for you guys is, you know, what is the most important thing uh, for a company, right? And the most important thing for a company is to have access to, to money when it needs it. And that ability changes for the uh, life during a life cycle of a company from when it's just a small startup operation operating out of a garage to when it's a you know, Fortune 500 company uh, that needs you know, billions and billions of dollars every quarter just to pay its workers and to keep on doing the things that uh, it does to make goods and services for its customers. So there are four sort of phases of, a, of a, the life of a company. The first is sort of the emerging growth venture capital phase. That's sort of what you probably would see in Silicon Valley, uh, the TV show and the real place. Uh, your typical borrower would be a startup company with a promising future, some good tech, something uh, that it has to offer the world. The investors would typically be sophisticated investors like uh, venture capital partnerships or uh, family offices. The general traits of those transactions is that they're very high risk and high reward. Investors may want to hold their investment to potentially sell to another investor later on as the company becomes more profitable. The next thing we, we typically have is the uh, middle stage of these companies when it's a growth uh, company. And that typically attracts the eyes of private equity. Now, the typical borrower organization at this point, its profile would be a company with proven marketability uh, that's able to raise uh, revenue through some product or service that it offers. And the typical investors that are driving these transactions are uh, PE firms, clearly, but, but other people, uh, venture capital partnerships, depending on their size, are still involved. Investment funds and endowments start to uh, take interest in this as well. The general traits of these transactions are kind of like the previous, but at this point, companies are at a very important decision point in their uh, development. They have to decide whether it makes sense, more sense to, um, to sell to uh, another company, potentially merge into a bigger and uh, more established company, or if they feel that uh, if the company feels that it has the you know, technology or the revenue stream to continue to be its own company, it might decide to uh, become an independent company and capitalize that way. So that takes us to the third stage, which is, I would say like the, the late middle stage mature phase, which is when the company now becomes public. It, it calls a, a big law firm such as ours to uh, to go public, and that's the phrase you would typically hear. And uh, the borrower at this point would be a company again with established uh, revenues that that is doing um, a lot of business in, in the world. Your investors at this point would expand to a, a lot of people. Um, you would have endowments of you know from Harvard, for instance. Uh, you would have all variety of funds, investment funds, sovereign wealth funds, hedge funds, pension funds, and uh, Importantly, a lot of times investment banks will start to help facilitate this process because the dollar amounts involved tend to get really big. The general traits of these transactions are that investors um, take ownership of these positions in companies and you know, the whole purpose of what they're trying to do is to you know, eventually resell in a secondary market. Um, and again, a large dollar amount is typically involved. Now, we go into sort of the structured finance, uh, mature company phase or late phase of a company sort of towards the end here. And what we have at the very end of this process is a very mature company uh, that's you know maybe a Fortune 500 company, maybe not, but they are involved in a lot of business credit. They you know have a lot of people buying things on credit and they have such huge capital demands that not one bank or one investor can really satisfy what they're trying to do uh, every quarter or every month. So what they what they do is they turn to capital markets. Oftentimes, um, you know, banks of of uh, a large variety, the, the big banks you can probably think of. Uh, the tra uh, the transactions typically involve large dollar amounts, and they float operations for these companies uh, at a lower cost of capital than a straight bank loan, and uh, the investors are, are numerous and the, the money amounts are so big that the uh, investors, the law firms involved can help us uh, create different sorts of profiles for the investments that the investors are willing to take on. Now, 
throughout this entire process, you know, no matter if a transaction is five million dollars versus fifty million or five hundred million dollars, you know, they can all be very complex and involve a lot of time on our end uh, in law firms helping structure them and helping uh, draft documents. But the primary idea here is cost of capital, right? The a, a company will have access to different avenues to raise capital at different costs at different points of its development. And, um, you know, when companies get really big, they can use different uh, avenues in order to raise uh, capital at a lower cost. So that is essentially the big driver of all these different um, four realms that, that we have here. And that is the brief introduction to uh, what we do. Well, thanks, Raul. Um, first off, thank you all uh, for taking the time and joining. Um, it's not like there's anything else important going on in the world right now, so really appreciate uh, this opportunity. Um, before I kick it off, I just want to do a, a brief introduction um, on Morgan Lewis. If you are not familiar, um, we are an international law firm. We have 31 offices around the world, uh, 2,000 plus lawyers, 15 practice groups spanning 17 times zones. Um, so we are a very big firm. Um, in terms of a uh, question for you guys, um, which is where do we have summer program uh, locations? So um, in the U.S., as you'll see on this next slide, we have a number of offices, East Coast, West Coast, um, and in the middle as well. So uh, after this presentation, if anybody has any specific questions um, on our program, on our firm. Um, as you heard in the introduction, we are in a number of different offices um, at the firm. So if you're looking to get a better understanding of you know, what each office does along the capital markets route, uh, we are happy to answer any questions you have there. So I'm going to kick it off uh, with what happens at the very uh, start. Um, when we were preparing for this panel, we were thinking, okay, back in our law school days, you know, what would be useful for us? Um, and we thought what would be useful is to literally walk through a life cycle of the company and highlight um, the things that each of us does in the capital market space related to the company. So kicking off, I do a lot of work uh, in the emerging growth stage for anybody who's watched um, the show Silicon Valley. Um, it's kind of exactly like that. Um, we get these uh, very brilliant people, not just in Silicon Valley, but around the world um, who have great ideas um, on how they want to change the world. And our job is literally to guide them through um, that process. Um, so if we can go to the next slide, please. Great. So um, one of the first steps is, you know, in incorporation. How do you want your entity to be formed? And that really depends on the goal of the founder. Um, and so as a, as a lawyer, you know, it's my job to really sit down with them. What are your objectives? Are, are you trying to get um, serious capital? Are you trying to uh, build the technology first uh, without getting any investors to ensure that you have complete control over the company? Um, really working with them to make sure that we structure their objectives, incorporate them in the state or the country that makes the most sense, as well as in the entity form um, that makes most sense. Um, another issue that we deal with at the get-go is how to deal with founders. Um, so at the very beginning, as you can imagine, in any relationship, everything is peachy. Um, you are going to be best friends forever. Um, but the, the fact of the matter is, is as lawyers, uh, we have to talk about um, the risks uh, and the what-ifs. And so really working with founders to say, well, you know, what are you bringing to the table? How can we make sure that each of you stays engaged in the business and, and brings it um, your, your A game? Um, as you can imagine, there's a huge market um, for uh, skilled people in tech. And so uh, the risk is pretty high that they uh, get poached, jump to another company, or even that they just think of something uh, new that they want to do with the technology. So part of what I do in the emerging growth space is making sure uh, that the founders are properly incentivized and uh, in, in some ways contractually bound uh, to the company to make sure um, that that startup uh, does what they need um, to do. Um, and then uh, kind of the third stage is, is bringing in the team, uh, making sure that you have the right people 
um, to, to start this business. Um, so, you know, at that point, the company is, is kind of running still, you know, your standard uh, work from home, work in, you know, somebody's garage, um, as the Silicon Valley stereotype is. And then you get to early stage uh, financing. So you need a little bit more capital to actually uh, do what you need to do, or you need some capital so that, you know, you can eat. Um, and so our job as lawyers is to figure out uh, some of the easier ways um, to get capital um, because a lot of the VC funds, banks aren't going to be willing to uh, lend the kind of money uh, that they need with a company that's at such uh, an early point in their career. Uh, they may not have uh, developed uh, a working prototype yet or really uh, flushed out what the objective of the company is. Um, so of course, uh, the first uh, step is uh, within. So founders uh, will fund the company using their savings, uh, their family, friends will get in on it um, and really support them that way. So making sure um, that people uh, are protected as investors, making sure the company is protected because you'll have uh, people um, Oddly enough, the, the ones who own the least amount of shares are often the ones uh, who have the most questions and demands. Um, so setting up a company to be uh, incredibly flexible um, and, and able to operate despite the fact that they are now beholden uh, to shareholders. At this point, you're also working with what are called angel investors. Um, if you've heard uh, the group's band of angels, uh, for example, these are, are networks uh, of people who are willing to fund kind of small amounts. You're talking, you know, 20,000 to 100,000 uh, to get a company uh, off the ground. Um, and so again, working uh, with, with those um, early stage investors and, and getting the company um, what they need. Progress even further, and now you have your mid to late stage companies. And these are probably the companies uh, in, in, uh, in the world that you are really um, intimately familiar with. Um, you know, without name dropping client names, uh, pretty much every uh, big tech company uh, is, is represented uh, by Morgan Lewis in, in some form or fashion. Um, and so we're, we're working with them to figure out um, how they're going to get the big dollars now uh, that they need to fund their business, um, you know, millions up to hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, I work on both company side investments, so accepting the money as well as the venture side investment, uh, making sure um, that the investors uh, are getting uh, their money's worth when they put money into a business. Um, and so at that point, it becomes really important how uh, the company is going to exit. Uh, so the founder, they've put in years at this point, their, their blood, sweat, and tears. Um, the venture funds, they've put in their money. They're looking for a good exit, um, a good ROI, return on their investment. Um, and so you get to uh, this crossroads, um, which is in this very handy dandy next slide, please. Um, do you want to uh, maintain the business, keep growing as a standalone, or do you want to go one of two routes? One is the M&A route, which I will talk about uh, momentarily, and the second is the IPO route. So M&A, um, incredibly uh, fast-paced and exciting, which is one of the reasons why uh, I decided to uh, pursue an emphasis in M&A. Uh, my very first M&A deal with Morgan Lewis, uh, I was representing a little known company at the time called Siri, um, who had this interesting technology that Apple uh, wanted uh, to obtain. And little did we know it would turn into what it is, um, it is now. So in terms of just giving you a really brief overview of what happens in the M&A stage, um, if a company uh, decides that they want to get sold, if they get an offer um, unsolicited from uh, the outside world that says, hey, I'm really interested in, in what you do, um, uh, the first step is to enter into an NDA, a non-disclosure agreement, because you want to be able to share this really important information about what your company does, um, but you want to make sure that it's kept 
uh, confidential. Um, a lot of this is secret sauce and you don't want that kind of out in the world. So uh, first step is for us to put in place a very solid NDA that locks up people um, who have access to information, making sure that they just can't share that around um, publicly. The next step is uh, a term sheet or a letter of intent. Uh, and that really sets out the key terms and structure of, of the deal. Um, and a lot of that is, is figuring out, you know, what is the key focus of the transaction? Um, is, is the goal uh, to get the people, which is called an aqua hire? Uh, is it to uh, uh, block somebody from uh, taking a, a chunk of the market share? So you're essentially eliminating a competitor. Um, is it the acquisition of the customer base? Is it the acquisition of the technology itself or even just a portion of the technology? I mean, you would be surprised. There's, there's lots of acquisitions that are done um, of entire companies. And really the, the, um, the gold in it is just a fraction of, of their technology. Um, so based on what that objective is, uh, we then will draft up a term sheet with the, the key terms. Uh, obviously, the big one is purchase price. Um, and uh, company side, you know, we're focused on getting the biggest value uh, for our client um, and making sure that that money gets paid out um, with certainty and as quickly as possible to the closing date. Uh, contrast that though uh, with the acquirer. So when we're representing the acquirer, we're focused on making sure that we're actually getting uh, the value of what we paid for. So a lot of the uh, purchase price will either be held back uh, to make sure that key people are staying with the business um, or that uh, lawsuits aren't filed. Um, so it's, it's, it is interesting being on both sides of the transaction because uh, although the deal itself is the same, uh, the objectives and how we're structuring things are indeed different. Uh, within the body of an M&A agreement, in case uh, you guys haven't been bored at two o'clock in the morning and looked up SEC public filings on what an M&A looks like, um, just really quickly, the first is uh, you know the business terms, like I mentioned. The second is what's called reps and warranties. Um, and this is a huge chunk of the negotiation in an M&A. And what the seller needs to do is they need to make factual statements about the business that the buyer is going to hold them to. So these are our financials. We are duly incorporated. We have the right to enter into um, this agreement. And uh, this is pages and pages of carefully negotiated uh, reps uh, that the company is making. Another section is called the conditions to closing. Um, these include things like, well, did you get third party approvals to actually enter into this deal? Do you have regulatory filings uh, with the government, um, US or abroad? Uh, I have a number of transactions right now that are in the waiting stage because we need official government sign off uh, to proceed with the deal. Otherwise, the US government could come back later and, and unwind the transaction or subject uh, the company to lawsuits, which is something that neither party really wants. So really being careful, looking at uh, the business as well as the state of the world uh, and figuring out what needs to be in place. Another section is called covenants. It's the promises that people are making after the deal is over. Uh, so imagine that you just spent uh, $10 billion on a company. The last thing you want is for the founder to then run off and start a competing company. Um, so making sure that you have these covenants in place uh, of what people say they are going to do or are not going to do. Uh, and finally, uh, the uh, last kind of key portion of an M&A agreement is called the indemnification section. And it says uh, that each party uh, or the seller is going to hold the buyer harmless in the event that somebody uh, makes a claim. And it could be something really small like, hey, you didn't actually pay your lawyers uh, for the transaction, or it could be you do not actually own uh, the technology that you say you do uh, and that you just sold. Um, so I'll just end by saying one of the reasons that I uh, was really interested in these two spaces of emerging growth business and M&A uh, was, you know, number one, it's always really exciting to see the newest and coolest technology out there and getting to work with clients who are telling uh, you that they have these great inventions that are going to change the world. Um, it's, it's pretty interesting. 
Um, and, and lastly, I, I really enjoy the M&A side because it allows me to collaborate with my you know, colleagues around the world in our numerous offices um, and, and figure out the best way to get the deal done. So working with employment counsel, tax counsel, um, IP counsel, um, it, is, uh, it is a very collaborative uh, practice. Um, it's a time intensive practice, um, but I would consider it to be a very fun one. Uh, so I guess I will then turn it on to the next level of fun, which is IPOs. Thanks, Karen. Uh, so the, there's an excellent explanation of you know how, how an idea becomes a company. And uh, once they do go through their alphabet list of, of financings and they're really ready to seek an, a liquidity event, as Karen mentioned, they'll usually either choose to sell through an M&A transaction or they'll go public. Um, a, a big reason for, for several of our clients to go public is they want to provide liquidity not only to their investors, but also to you know, their, their employees that have been there for years and years and have had options. And you really can't do much with them while you're a private company. Um, there's, there's a few you know, private markets that have popped up here, there, but they're just, you can't get the same liquidity that you can if you're a public company. Um, so once a company has decided that they do want to go through the IPO process, uh, there's several things that they need to think about, not least of which being the IPO process is heavily um, you know, scrutinized. There's companies that go through the process and spend millions of dollars on lawyers, on banks, on accountants because of the SEC's review of the process. Um, this slide here cover, or, sorry, you can go next slide. This slide will give you just a, a few of the a few of the you know Securities Act sections that you need to keep an eye on. Um, these explain you know, what you can do with a registration statement and explain really why you have to file what's called your Form S1, which is your registration statement that you file with the SEC, go through several rounds of comment with them, and eventually hopefully take effective and go public. Uh, I won't go too far into these. If you choose to take sec uh, securities regulation. Uh, which I have to put in a plug, I enjoyed, but I'm a capital markets attorney, so of course I did. Uh, you'll go through these and you'll learn in, in a lot greater detail. I don't wanna bore anyone with them now. Uh, you can go to the next one. Those rules all really tie into what's, what's called a gun jumping. It's a term you'll hear a lot. Uh, and it's really intended to stop companies from selling themselves to the public before the SEC says that you can. Um, that's what's known as gun jumping. So really what happens is what, once you decide you're going to go public, the company sort of shuts down, reaching out to investors, doing any of that. And their sole purpose is getting the S1 through the SEC review process so that they can finally approach the investors that they want to buy their shares in the IPO on what's called their roadshow and then um, sell those shares once they have an effective SEC approved registration statement. You can go to the next one. So here's a, a quick timetable, and I'm not gonna get too into the weeds. We don't have too much time, but these slides are a good resource if you ever wanna know, you know, if you see someone files a public registration statement, you're trying to get an idea of where they are in the process. This will give you a general idea of where they sit and what you can and can't do at various times um, throughout the process. You can go to the next one. A big part of going public and frankly of going through an M&A transaction is going through due diligence. Uh, this is something that as an associate, you'd be spending a lot of time on in the beginning portion of the deal. Um, and frankly, all the way through the deal is you know, reviewing the company's documents, reviewing their financial projections, reviewing really everything about the company to make sure that the company is what they say they are. Uh, the reason in this, process, why it's really important for the attorneys is in connection with the IPO, the law firm is required to deliver what's called both a legal opinion, where we opine on the legality of several aspects of the IPO, and we're asked to give a negative assurance letter. The negative assurance letter requires us as lawyers to tell the underwriters, the bankers, that 
we believe everything that the company is saying in that S1 is true. And for us to be able to do that, we really have to get in and get our hands dirty and dig through everything the company does and says in that S1 to make sure it's true. Uh, if you do eventually become a capital markets attorney and you do begin working on IPOs, you'll work on what are called circle ups. A circle up is where the banker's attorneys will circle every statement of fact in the S1 and you have to go through and you have to prove each of them are true. So it, it is a tedious process, but also an important one. Uh, you can go to the next one. Another big part of going public is you usually tweak your certificate of incorporation and bylaws. Uh, again, I don't want to spend too much time, but really preparing yourself to be a public company. So you're removing some of the things, some of the rights you gave your investors when you were private, and you're really getting ready to, to live life as a public company. Um, I think we can skip all the way to slide. Where is the date? Skip to 18. Yeah. So this is a big decision that companies make is choosing which exchange they want to go on. Uh, NASDAQ has always been more commonly chosen, it seems, by you know tech companies and biotech companies, which those are the two industries in which I, I most frequently work. Uh, NYSC has been around for forever. They still have the you know the trading floor, which if you're ever in New York, I suggest you try to uh, to visit. It's a it's neat to see. Uh, obviously, in in the future, hopefully. Um, and another big thing for companies is choosing your symbol, which some companies, it's it's easy. Others, you'd be surprised how many hours are burned trying to figure out exactly what one to four letters they want to use as their trading symbol. Um, you can go to the next one. Another big key for emerging growth or for a company going public is whether they qualify as an emerging growth company or an EGC. Um, the SEC, I was going to say recently, not that recently ago, um, created this, this concept, and it really is it's intended to make the IPO process easier for companies that are relatively young or relatively um, small. So companies that have, been pub or that have been around for forever and they decide to go public and they've got billions and billions of dollars of revenue, they can afford to go through the millions of dollars it, it takes to do all of this. Uh, smaller companies, a lot of biotech companies will go public before they have a dollar of revenue. So they're very cash strapped. So the SEC making these few uh, accommodations does make it a little bit easier for them. We'll see those on the next slide. Uh, so here are some of the accommodations. Uh, a year fewer of audited financials, which saves money on auditors, reduced disclosures on your comp. Um, you can file your S1 confidentially, which uh, is useful. Uh, testing the waters meetings, which I'll only touch on very briefly, are um, those are meetings that you're allowed to take with investors before you go public and before you have an effective registration statement, just to see if there's any appetite in the investment community for your for your IPO. Uh, those are now available to everyone. That's that's relatively recent. Uh, we can go to the next slide, please. So preparing a registration statement. This is a list of the different sections that you'll see in any IPO registration statement. And they're really interesting. If you, like my wife and I, we just bought a Peloton bike. Peloton recently went public. So I was too excited to scroll through their S1 and see what they said about the business and all of their financials, things like that. Um, if you get a chance and you're again bored at 2 a.m. and you want to do some reading, I highly suggest it. Uh, these are the various things that you'll you'll see in a registration statement. Um, they all have their own specific rules that need to be followed per the SEC. Um, and the bankers will also want to work with you to ensure that you're selling, the, that you're describing the company in a way that people will actually want to invest. Um, next slide. So here's the big one, and here's where um, I'll finish my portion. And this is, these are the steps that you'll take from filing your first registration statement to going public. Uh, so you'll file, typically you'll confidentially file your registration statement. You'll go through three or four rounds of comments with the SEC. Usually that takes two to three months. 
Um, once you're generally done with your comments, you'll file your public S1. You'll have to wait 15 days to go on the roadshow. Um, before you go on your roadshow, you'll file what's called your red herring prospectus. Um, and that has your pricing information, most importantly. You go out, you, you meet with the investors, assuming you have a deal, you'll price your IPO, and then it's now two days later, you'll close. Um, the whole process takes between three to six months, typically, so it's not a not a quick thing. You can usually do you know, venture capital or smaller financing in, say, I don't know, a month or less, depending on how interested everyone is in getting a deal done. Uh, IPOs, are, my favorite part about working in the capital market space is you just really get to know your client, or if you're working on the banking side, you get to know the other side. And you, I feel like you you learn so much about a company that you don't always get to do while you're doing just one-off transactions with them. You really get to know everyone at the company that, um, and I, I just really enjoyed it. It's, it's fun. Uh, so with that, I'll pass it along to Caitlin and Roel. Thanks, Brian. Uh, Roel and I are going to be talking a little bit about the work that we do, which is structured finance. Next slide, please. So I'm going to focus on securitization because that's a large part of what we do in our practice um, and what we would consider our specialty in the structured transactions group at Morgan Lewis. So first off, what is securitization? Um, if I can do one thing today, it will be to try to answer that question. Um, so securitization is generally understood to be the process of transferring a pool of assets, um, of self-amortizing assets, to a bankruptcy remote special purpose entity, which uses the cash flows generated by such assets to make payments on securities issued by that special purpose entity. So let's break that down because I know that's a bit of a mouthful. So first of all, what's a self-amortizing asset? So that's an asset that by its terms converts to cash upon the conclusion of the scheduled term. So for example, this is mortgage loans, automobile leases, student loans. These are all self-amortizing because they'll eventually be fully repaid if all scheduled payments are made on time. For me, I like to think about student loans because that's an asset class I have experience with for better or worse. Um, I know that my student loans are self-amortizing because ideally I make payments on time each month and then at the end of the term, they're fully repaid. Another part of the definition that I gave you, what is a bankruptcy remote entity and why is that important? Um, so an entity is bankruptcy remote if its assets are unaffected by the bankruptcy of another entity. So structured properly, the assets of the issuer in a securitization will be unaffected by the bankruptcy of the originator or the transfer of those assets. Um, so the bankruptcy remoteness of the issuers, one of the defining features of a securitization transaction, um, arguably the primary reason that uh, asset-backed securities are able to obtain investment grade ratings, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, and that's even when the entity that originated or transferred those assets does not itself have an investment, grade, sorry, investment grade rating. You can go to the next slide, please. Okay, so like I just said, securitization refers to the process in which a special purpose entity issues securities backed by a pool of self-amortizing assets held by it. So we can think of structured finance more broadly as any transaction in which a special purpose entity holding self-amortizing assets is involved. Uh, not all structured finance transactions are securitizations, um, but all securitizations are structured finance transactions. So for example, we have on this slide warehouse lines of credit, um, a loan or a line of credit made to a special purpose entity holding a pool of self-amortizing assets would not be considered a securitization, but could be thought of as a structured finance transaction. Um, if you could go to the next slide, please. Okay, so let's talk about the benefits of a securitization. It's two part. So for the investor in a securitization, the primary benefit is the ability to purchase a security backed by the cash flows of a discrete asset without exposure to the credit risk of the entity that originated or acquired those assets. So what that means is that in the event of a bankruptcy petition by the sponsor, so the sponsor's the entity, 
either originated or acquired the underlying assets. Um, those assets will not be included in the sponsor's bankruptcy estate. So it means the securities are otherwise unaffected. So if you are a company like SoFi and you issue notes backed by the student loans that you, SoFi, originated, you go into a bankruptcy petition. The assets that backed those notes that you issued will not be affected by that bankruptcy. So comparing that to a traditional unsecured corporate bond in the event of a bankruptcy of the issuer in that case, an investor would likely become or they would become an unsecured creditor. Ultimately, they're going to receive less than they're entitled to under the terms of their bond. So I said it was two parts. So the benefit on the other side for the issuer of asset-backed securities, the primary benefit of securitization is lower financing costs. Um, this is generally the function of credit ratings. So I said I would talk a little bit about credit ratings. Um, most issuers of unsecured corporate debt have credit ratings that are below the highest rating given by a rating agency. Because of the structure of a securitization transaction, certain securities that are going to be issued by the issuer in a securitization are given investment grade ratings. Some will get the highest rating, which is AAA. Um, that means that investors are going to pay more for bonds with higher ratings, and that means lower costs for the borrower. Can go to the next slide, please. Um, you know, I think I covered this on the last one, so we can go to the next one. Thanks. Okay, so who are our clients? Um, our clients are going to be all the banks that you've heard of, JP Morgan, you know, uh, Morgan Stanley, all of the big banks that we know, uh, specialty finance companies. Um, I mentioned student loan companies, but that also includes mortgage originators, mortgage servicers, hedge funds. Um, on the other side of this slide, the types of transactions that we do. So I'm not going to go too much into the other types of transactions that we do, but in addition to public and private securities offerings, we work on structured financings, uh, sorry, secured financings, which includes warehouse financings, repos, M&A, which includes asset sales and purchases. Um, and if you could go to the next slide, please. Um, so this is our spiel for the Morgan Lewis Structured Transactions Group. Um, I won't read all of this, um, but we're recognized leaders in structured finance and capital markets. We've been key players since the inception of structured finance. Um, our, one of the main reasons why I joined this group as a lateral um, in my second year of practicing is because I met the partners in this group who had been working together, almost all of them as a team um, for upwards of 20 years. And so coming into a group that does something as complicated as structured finance, but having a team that really knows each other so well, um, that was a big key for me. Um, and I think with that, I can turn it over to Raul. Great, thanks, Caitlin. And uh, you know, just to, my job here will be fun. I get to show you a lot of pictures, uh, which is fun for, for what we do since it's, it's pretty, you know, there's a lot of big words and a lot of kind of big concepts, but ultimately, you know, like Caitlin was talking about, what we do is we represent either a company or a bank, um, an investor, and we help them out with these three different categories here um, that their assets fall into. Now you see companies that we typically think of like making something or doing a service, they are generally in the asset-backed securities world. Now um, you can see that there's a whole list of, of fun, exciting things that fall into that category, things ranging from aircrafts to solar panel leases. I've actually worked on a um, like auction house financing recently that that was very interesting uh, type of work. But the biggest player uh, is the one in the middle and that's the mortgage backed security world. They're uh, just because of the complexity of or the uniquely American institution of our, uh, our government sponsored entities, the uh, alphabet soup of Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, uh, Ginny Mae. We have a lot of loans that are essentially indirectly backed by the full faith and credit 
of the United States of America. So that's a pretty good um, safe investment for, for big banks and a lot of investor demand to get their hands on some of this stuff. The stuff on the right in the green category, CLOs, CDOs, that is a very specialized uh, form of structured uh, finance in our structured transactions group. And that is typically um, you know, bank uh, driven and uh, investor driven. And the only real difference between all of the things we're talking about here is that you know, what Caitlin was talking about is we reduce uh, the likelihood of bankruptcy uh, default. So if one company that does a lot of business, let's say your FANG stocks all get together and I'm a bank who makes loans to each one of those, the, the likelihood that one of those places gets hit by, by lightning or a, a ransomware attack, you know, that's, that could really impact that business and its ability to, to pay on its loans. So what we do is we, we lower that risk by creating these bankruptcy remote entities. Now, uh, the CLOs and CDOs take those uh, loans to big companies like that and turn it into this, uh, this different uh, system where, where different investors can invest at uh, different amounts. And can we go on to the next slide, please? Great. Now we talked a lot about this already, uh, and Caitlin did a great job explaining the difference between securitization and structured finance. Uh, structured finance is just generally a little bit broader. It's more of the work I do um, that's sort of ancillary to the main things in securitization. And that is basically uh, you know, a, a way for us to reduce the cost of capital to investors and to, uh, to companies really, because they are the ones who have, let's say, a bank loan to a big bank in a, for the amount of $2 billion, right? That's a lot of risk for a bank to keep on its balance sheet. So what we do is we use these bankruptcy remote structures again to uh, separate the assets from the company so that if the company has anything bad happen to it, uh, those assets will still uh, continue to be uh, paid back. And you know a lot of business in America is done over credit. So basically we have a lot of promissory notes which are glorified IOUs out there that um, will, will happen, uh, that, that will be paid back over time. Uh, the one key point on the end here is uh, we have a different uh, variety of categories that we kind of alluded to at the beginning. Our big uh, categories of assets, financial assets, are loans uh, and leases and uh, mortgages. So one of the, the big, there's a whole laundry list of things here to go through as well. Uh, but the most important one is warehouse lending in this space. That is sort of like a, a prequel to a big securitization that helps uh, different entities make loans or uh, give money out to, to, to buy different things. And if you get enough of those together, securitizations can be kind of expensive. So maybe a big company does one of these a year, a big securitization, but they do smaller warehouse loans uh, der to, to finance their quarterly, um, you know, their, their quarterly finance needs. And can we move to the next slide, please? All right, so this is a fun picture of sort of the paper we draft, what it actually does. Now, I'm not gonna go into all of the different parts here, but as you can see, we have this corporation A, right? That could be any big company, has a lot of credit, um, lots of sales on credit that, that's made to different people. We have this process where we get those loans into a special purpose entity down into a trust or an LLC. and that LLC then sells its own equity, right? Its ownership to this the entity we call the depositor, uh, which sort of holds on to that for a little while, sells it off to, to the investors in the form of notes or, um, or actual equity securities. And we have this entity kind of unique to the work we do is that in order to think of debt as something that can be bought and sold, you know, there's a right to receive payment on a debt. And that right to receive payment on a debt is always collected by somebody. Someone's always checking the, the spreadsheet to see how much money someone owes uh, of a debt. So that person is called a servicer or that entity rather is a servicer. And that just helps us uh, sell debt in capital markets and move money around. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? This is the general flowchart of how 
um, securitization process works. So we have our big company that has loans or financial assets. It sells it off to a special purpose entity, which is usually an LLC or a trust. And that's something that you, we usually create. So, you know, the corporate work we do would go from drafting the articles of incorporation for, you know, uh, an LLC or, um, you know, it's LLC agreement or, um, you know, drafting a trust agreement, things like that. We, we kind of do all the parts of the process. Uh, the next thing to do, uh, we kind of described part of this already, but the certificates here are uh, basically just a representation of that LLC or that trust equity, uh, which it sells um, to the S uh, to the special purpose entity in exchange for proceeds. Um, and we already talked about what the servicer does. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? All right, this, this is a, a slightly different structure where we're selling uh, basically debt of that special purpose entity out to the markets, which are, are rated. These are uh, a variety of, of the steps that we go through. We have, an, like Caitlin mentioned, an asset pool that uh, you know is made at origination, which is when you know if I'm borrowing for student loan, that would be a moment of origination. Then the person who made me the loan sells it off to an investor, um, and it goes through this process in order to turn it into a uh, a security that can be uh, held by an investor. We have some of. Uh, just further representations towards the end of this presentation showing you about the different, I would say, like magnitude of the market we have here. So again, mortgage takes up a huge space. Uh, we can go on to the next slide. We have a, a bunch of, you know, different types of things, home equity lines of credit, uh, government sponsored uh, loans as well. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, for for asset-backed securities, we have um, a variety of fun things as well. Auto loans take up a big portion of the market. Uh, student loans as well. FinTech is its own uh, thing as well. And we also have an esoteric asset. So basically anything that has a payment stream can be securitized through this process. As you can see, there's a lot of fun things that we can do uh, from trailer homes to, uh, to churches. Uh, we, we do everything. And uh, I think we can just go touch these really briefly. These are just um, charts of our, our client base. It shows you it's a pretty good representation of the market and uh, the volume of the market. And next slide, please. And again, we talked about mortgage and uh, the, the variety of different assets that make up the, the base of this. So, and CLOs are pretty equally divided among the three groups here. Um, they're just the three parties involved. We want to leave enough time for questions for everyone at the end here. So we will, uh, yeah, we will go ahead and take those now. Just want to thank everyone again for uh, coming out to hear us uh, present this topic to you. Yes, thank you, Raul. Thank you, everyone, Caitlin, Karen, Brian. Um, I will stop my screen share here just for a moment to access the Q&A panel. Um, we encourage everyone who's attending to please submit questions through the Q&A feature. Um, and we uh, have been answering them slowly as the presentation has been going on here. Um, so thank you to everyone who submitted questions already, um, but we encourage everyone to submit additional questions as well. Um, in the meantime, it might be useful. A lot of students who are 1Ls and 2Ls may not really know exactly what corporate area they're interested in pursuing. Um, maybe they like kind of a lot of the things that we've touched on today. What advice would you all have for students who are, are still trying to figure out what corporate practice area to focus on? Maybe you want to start with um, maybe Karen? Sure. Um, so I would say uh, for uh, law students, one of the first things you guys should be thinking about is where you want to practice geographically, because where you want to practice does have a bit of impact uh, on the type of corporate law or deals that you will be exposed to. So Morgan Lewis having, you know, as many offices around the world as we do, absolutely you'll have the opportunity to do 
uh, all different kinds of, of corporate work, but your home base will have uh, a number of very specific uh, deals. So for example, for, for uh, me in Northern California, we don't do a lot of structured transactions work. We just call up Caitlin and Raul and say, all right, you guys handle this. Um, and likewise, um, you know, from the Philadelphia office, Miami office, we'll get a lot of calls we need standard uh, tech M&A uh, work, so they'll reach out to us. I think if you are still trying to figure out you know, what area of corporate law you're interested in, you're not pigeonholed um, at, the, at the beginning of your career, we absolutely encourage uh, associates to you know, dabble, see what they like, see what they don't like, that's equally as important. Um, but having a sense of the general geography of where you want to be, uh, that will impact uh, the type of corporate law uh, that you get the most exposure to. If I could just add one quick thing to that, you know, I would say uh, further to Karen's discussion earlier, you know, there's a lot of good shows out there. There's good TV to watch i can kind of fill you on the background silicon valley is some good watching uh for what the work we do michael lewis books and novels are, are wonderful to kind of give you a sense of the energy uh, of the work we do thank you so much we have a question here um, from an attendee who mentions that morgan lewis sponsored halb's international trek to japan last year uh, and we visited your japan office i personally wasn't able to make that trip but um so very nice for someone to mention that um, so, but this question kind of wants us to touch a bit on the collaboration across Morgan Lewis's international offices. Um, does someone want to jump in to talk about that? Brian, sure, you I'll, I'll take, take that a one. shot. Perfect. <laughs> yeah, uh, we we really do. We work with our international colleagues all the time. Um, we at Morgan Lewis, we are one global firm. We're, we're not really siloed to separate offices. I, I personally, working in capital markets, I work with our co with our colleagues in London a lot to answer the other question um, that it looks like just came in. Um, we interface with our with our folks in London all the time for, with respect to you know, English companies that either want to list here in the U.S. or investors in England that want to invest in U.S. companies. We do a lot of cross border work in our capital markets practice uh, in. Our Singapore office, we do a, a ton of IPO work there. Um, and I've been recently working more and more with our folks out there just to uh, to see what we can learn from one another and how we can help one another out. Uh, the great thing is there's always someone at Morgan Lewis that knows the answer to the question that we get. And frequently we find that our international folks are, are excellent resources at answering questions, not only subject matter, but also you know, local custom or practice. So we work with them all the time. Yeah, I'll just add to that. I mean, given the nature of our, our clients, there is a, a, almost a requirement for international collaboration. So right now I have a, a deal um, involving a Japanese company, uh, an East Coast company and a California company. And so we're working um, across uh, all different time zones right now and, and different offices. And I'm having one of my associates also interface with our London office uh, because uh, one of the companies has uh, a subsidiary in the UK. Um, and so just by nature of the work we do and the clients we have, and I think my son fully agrees with that, um, there's absolutely opportunity for exposure uh, to the international offices. Thank you so much. And we might have time for one last quick question here. Um, are there any specific readings, experiences, or skills you'd recommend for incoming first year associates? Maybe we want to start with um, Caitlin, do you have any insight on this? Yeah, I can answer that. Um, I think especially for corporate attorneys, um, you know, law school, at least in my experience, there was a large focus on litigation. And I think you had to kind of find those opportunities, those clinics, those classes, those seminars, um, speaking and learning from practitioners in the field um, definitely help to see what do corporate attorneys actually do. That probably wasn't a question I could answer going into law school and maybe even my first year. Um, so finding those opportunities, like Raul said, um, 
there are books, there are movies, um, there are TV shows you can watch and pay attention to what the lawyers are doing and then look up those words later and try to figure out, you know, what that actually means in practical terms. Thank you so much here. Being mindful of, of time, unless anyone else has anything else they'd like to add here in the final moments of our presentation. Being mindful of time. I wanted to thank everyone for participating. Thank you to all the panelists. Thank you to Morgan Lewis as well for sponsoring HALB. And um, thank you so much again. And I hope everyone has a great rest of the week and weekend and take care. Thanks Goodbye. everyone. Thanks, Christian.